Even the formation of landscapes, an area of geology long dominated by uniformitarian thinking, has had to be reconsidered. Geologists have tended to view landscape formation in terms of processes we can see going on around us, like the slow and steady wearing down of the land by streams and rivers. But few landforms seem to be the product of processes that are currently acting. Most are relic features that were formed by processes more energetic than those going on today. For example, evidence of the catastrophic flooding associated with the rapid melting of the ice sheets at the end of the Ice Age can be seen in landscapes all across the Northern Hemisphere. Recent sonar surveys of the floor of the English Channel, the narrow seaway between England and France, revealed a stunning network of large valleys which are thought to have been eroded by the catastrophic drainage of a large glacial lake. Large-scale discharges of glacial meltwater may even have been responsible for the permanent separation of Britain from mainland Europe. Catastrophic events have now become an acceptable, even necessary part of the modern geological world view. Most geologists still maintain, however, that the history of the Earth has lasted billions of years. They regard the catastrophes as rare occurrences, separated by long periods of time when no sediments were being laid down or when erosion was occurring. In one of his books, Derek Ager summed this up by saying that the history of any one part of the Earth, like the life of a soldier, consists of long periods of boredom and short periods of terror. If this view of Earth history is correct, then the geological record consists mainly of gaps with only occasional pulses of sedimentation. Long periods of time must have passed between the laying down of the preserved sedimentary layers. But is that what the evidence suggests? We've already seen that many individual rock layers were formed quickly, but quite often the next layer seems to have been added quickly too. We can illustrate this by taking a look at the rock layers exposed here in the Peak District of Derbyshire. This is Mam Tor, a popular place with walkers as well as geologists. Exposed in the east face of Mam Tor is a thick series of sandstone and mudstone layers, and they tell a fascinating story of rapid sedimentation uninterrupted by long time gaps. The whole cliff face here at Mam Tor is about 100 meters high and because each of these sandstone layers is on average about one meter thick that means there are about 100 of them in this cliff face. Now if the conventional geological dates are correct this whole cliff face must represent something like one million years of geological time and because there are 100 of these layers in this cliff that means that these must represent something like 10,000 years of geological time for each layer. But what does the evidence actually tell us? Well, here we have one of these sandstone layers at Mam Tor. On the 18th of November in 1929, a remarkable event occurred. Uh, an earthquake, the Grand Banks earthquake, struck the eastern seaboard of Canada and the maritime provinces there and caused a mass of sediment that was in the shallow water on the continental shelf to slump into deeper water. Now as that flow travelled, uh, it snapped transatlantic cables and so we know exactly how far that flow had travelled. And it turns out that in less than 13 hours, that slurry of sediment had travelled almost 500 miles and it deposited a layer of sediment about two to three feet thick that covered about 100,000 square miles of ocean floor. Geologists call that kind of current a turbidity current and the sediment that it leaves behind is called a turbidite. Now the significance of this is that these sandstones at Mam Tor are turbidites. These were laid down by that same kind of catastrophic underwater flow. So each of these sandstone layers represents just a few minutes of geological activity. Well, if the geological time is not represented by the sandstones, perhaps it's represented by these shale layers, the mudstones that you find in between the sandstones. 
And that's what most geologists, I think, would assume, that the, this was mud which was laid down in quiet conditions in between each of these catastrophic turbidite events. The problem is that if this mud formed the seafloor for an extended period of time, then there ought to have been time for animals, marine animals, to colonise this seafloor. And we really don't see evidence of a normal seafloor community in here. There are fossil shells, but if there are animals that were living here for any length of time, then they ought to have burrowed into this mud, into the sediment, and disrupted the mud layers. And yet, if you look at these mud layers, they're very well preserved. And that suggests that there wasn't a great deal of time involved in the laying down of these mudstone layers either. So here's the problem. Mam Tor is meant to represent something like one million years of geological time. But we've seen that the time is not represented by the sandstone layers, which were laid down in just a few minutes each. And it doesn't look as if much time is represented by the mudstone layers either. So the question is, where is the geological time at Mam Tor? The available evidence suggests that the cliff face at Mam Tor represents a short time interval, not one million years. The same reasoning can be applied to other parts of the geological record and it leads to the same conclusion. Larger and larger amounts of time must be accounted for in fewer and fewer layers. Convincing evidence for long ages of geological time is difficult to find.